This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We welcome you to this March 30th edition of the show on this Thursday. Jesperson here with Hicks. We got a fast moving show today, and I'm looking forward to it. Diane Francis, uh, a legend in journalism, editor at large with the National Post, is going to join us in about a half an hour's time. She's pretty bullish about the future of Alberta's energy sector. And, and her message, uh, a recent column of hers in the Financial Post, kind of flies in the face of some insight we had on the show earlier this week from a labor economist. And so we always want you to have the full information, a full understanding of what's going on, including with booms and busts and cycles and all of the things that you hear about in the news. So you're not going to want to miss that. Plus, we uh, sit down with three remarkable individuals in this week's edition of our official Real Talk Roundtable presented by our friends at Urban Timber. It's the team from CASA. Uh, It's youth Uh, Family Mental Health Supports, CASA has made a, they've set a bold course forward. They've uh, essentially made a commitment to double the services that they provide in mental health for families over the next short while. But how are they going to do it? And how bad is the need anyway? Uh, The entire city of Edmonton, for that matter, Alberta, the entire country mourned the murders of two police officers uh, just a short time ago, right? On March 16th, you remember just this week Uh, A procession, uh, a regimental funeral for these two officers who were gunned down, so say police, by a young person, a 16-year-old who'd been struggling with mental health issues, obviously his family struggling as well. And so we're going to talk to three individuals that are doing something about mental health supports at a time where they've never been more strongly needed. That's coming up. But we lead off today with a damning video released yesterday by the CBC In Alberta's official opposition, the NDP, that leaves no doubt about the relationship between Premier Danielle Smith and uh, wingnut, so-called street preacher, Uh, you can call yourself that, by the way, Arter Pavlovsky out of Calgary, who was tried back in February. He's waiting for the court's decision on charges relating to that Coots border blockade in southern Alberta. You remember the one I'm talking about. Now, if you don't know who this guy is, uh, he's got a long and, quite frankly, an ugly history in Alberta. Uh, He's spouted off on homophobic rants on multiple occasions. He's called public health officials Nazis through the pandemic. Uh, Most serious politicians have kept a healthy distance from this guy for years. So in this video, you've got a premier of a province hopping on a call with a man facing serious charges a month before his trial, saying some pretty significant things. Uh, We're going to play a bit of it in just a second. Through the 11-minute conversation, you try to get the premier of a province on the phone for 11 minutes, you'll hear uh, Smith lament the fact that she can't pardon uh, Pavlovsky like an American president might be able to do. She regrets that she can't pull political levers to drop charges that she says were laid for political reasons in the first place. At one point, she asks the accused to Leave it with her, almost as though Pawlowski's in the power position. Here's a little bit of the call. We, once the process is underway, I can ask our prosecutors, is there a reasonable likelihood of conviction? And is it in the public interest? And I assure you, I have asked them that almost weekly, ever since I got started here. There have been a number of cases that have been abandoned, at the last minute as they've gone through that assessment. And I'm very hopeful that that will be the case for more cases, but there isn't really a mechanism for me to order them to drop cases. It's complicated that way. It's just the way our legal system works, I'm afraid. It's the way our legal system works, I'm afraid. It sure sounds like she's working for him, doesn't it? It's a bad look for the premier, you know, who comes across as weak and capitulating and ignorant, quite frankly. It also shows you how greasy Pavlovsky's crew is. Remember, this video was posted on his YouTube channel for two months before anybody caught wind of it this week. But how bad is the conversation really? Like, in other words, how much damage could this do to Daniel Smith's prospects in a late May election? 
I'm not convinced this is the death blow the NDP thinks it is. I'm not sure the average Albertan will be that surprised by this. And, and to be honest, I expected the call to be a whole lot worse. Uh, now, I'm not excusing the premier here. It's a bad look if you run through the takeaways, right? Uh, Smith feels beholden to a degree to the far right fringe. Uh, she's been in, as she said, almost weekly contact with her team about getting charges dropped. She didn't realize she didn't have powers she thought she did. Uh, she doesn't think that COVID-related charges are warranted in the first place. But is this a surprise to anybody that's been paying attention, that's been listening to what she's been saying since she campaigned for the leadership of this party months ago? Like, did any bombs drop with that video that hadn't been apparent already? Let's take a second to look at a story that's running parallel to this one, but it's not seeing nearly as much sunlight. Tory Tanner is the United Conservative Party's candidate nominated down in Lethbridge. Uh, she's going like Alex Jones, Infowars, Marjorie Taylor Greene, whack job, conspiracy theory before the election. Here's a little bit of a video that her party just asked her to take down yesterday. Alarmingly, we are seeing increasing instances where kids, even those attending kindergarten, are being exposed to pornographic materials, or worse yet, having teachers help them change their gender identity with absolutely no parental consent or knowledge whatsoever. Okay, now anybody with an IQ above 50 knows that none of that is true. It's just not. It's fabricated, it's false, and it's harmful for a whole bunch of reasons. This is the type of thing that could lose Danielle Smith and the UCP the election. This could be Lake of Fire 2.0, 11 years later, right? It does not blow my mind that a far-right candidate or a right-wing candidate in southern Alberta, no less, believes and is spreading conspiracy theories about gender and sexuality in schools. What does blow my mind is the cavalier method uh, with which the party is treating this thus far. A statement from the UCP's comms director yesterday said that Tanner's comments, quote, don't accurately represent the policies and efforts to work with education partners. So they've asked her team to take the video down. No condemnation, no real distance created, definitely not dropping her as a candidate. You know, fringe flare-ups are nothing new with political candidates in Alberta. Anybody remember Alan Huntsberger in South Edmonton, 2012, Lake of Fire? But history, like Danielle Smith's history, she was the leader of the Wild Rose Party at that point. You don't need me to tell you that. Suggests that if these flare-ups are not meaningfully and completely extinguished, they can burn a party down. And Premier Smith and the UCP would be wise to take that seriously let us know what you think you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com i'm gonna say if you're watching or listening to this live streaming us on youtube or the mixler audio app you do still have time to fit in a trash talk that's coming up in just under an hour presented by our friends at local environmental services though you'll have to make it quick and it'll have to be solid because our trash talk lineup this week is rock solid these conversations are presented by Real Talk sponsors like the family-owned business at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. And this is a last call, so to speak, for a March promo available exclusively to Real Talkers. Now, through the month of March, we've been talking to you about the Doggy Moggy, the Chicken Raw Blend. This is that 40-pound box. It's on sale right now for $73.50. For the whole box with the discount code MARCH2023, you use that promo code at checkout at granddog.ca to receive your savings. Now, you've got till March 31st to place your order delivered free to your door in Edmonton, Calgary, and Central Alberta. And if you've got the freezer space, why not pick up two boxes? This Doggy Moggy chicken raw food is what our beloved three-year-old lab Monroe eats she loves it and we see the health benefits of her eating Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food day in day out again it's granddog.ca the promo code is March 2023 now for the humans in your house 
What's your plan for Easter dinner? Friesen Brothers has you covered. You know, more and more people are realizing that while a traditional sit-down dinner is a tradition worth preserving, maybe sitting over the stove and sweating while everybody else has laughs and great times is overrated. That's why I encourage you to order your Easter dinner with Catering by Friesen Brothers. At cateringbyfriesen.com, you can customize your Easter dinner, including some fabulous add-ons. I lose my mind over these dill carrots. That's my personal recommendation. But of course, there's a whole lot more to get into. You can read all about it online at cateringbyfriesen.com. And make sure you check out those famous Friesen Brothers sourdough hot crust buns, baked fresh in-store every day all the way through till Easter, only at Friesen Brothers. Hey, we told you just a couple of days ago that a real talker by the name of Dustin had reached out to us asking about our partnership with California Closets. Well, he heard his shout out on the show and then he sent us photos of the finished product. How cool is this? This is a viewer submitted before and after Johnny, let's go to the before first. You're going to see the blank wall. You're going to see a space that wasn't doing anything for the family. This is a brand new build in St. Albert's. They wanted room for a guest, but they didn't want the bed to take up the whole space. He says the California Closets crew was in and out, super professional, the work impeccable. And now the installation has elevated not just their experience, especially when they're entertaining, but also, of course, the value of their home. You can get your own free quote today. Get started with a free design consultation at californiaclosets.ca. And this weekend, when you're perhaps looking to maybe take some time out of the house, you're out running errands, and, and maybe you could use a quick stop for a bite to eat, Can we recommend the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park? We're always talking to you about those signature stack burger collections. If you haven't tried the double cheese stack burger, I'm telling you, Johnny can see it in my eyes every time I talk about it. This thing is next level. And of course, there's nothing like layers of celebration with a DQ cake. You can pick one up in store if you're in a rush or order yours in advance from the Dairy Queens at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. When you visit a Dairy Queen of Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park, you let them know that Real Talk sent you. Every week, we bring you a Real Talk Roundtable presented by our friends at Urban Timber. And we endeavor to dig deeper into issues, very real issues that Canadians are facing, in particular, Western Canadians, and oftentimes our friends and neighbors right here in Alberta. That's certainly the case today. As we look to address and learn more about what's being described by many professionals as a mental health crisis in the province. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome three formidable individuals here on behalf of CASA. You've probably heard about CASA before. If not, it's a great time to be tuned into Real Talk because we've got the CEO and two of her team members in house. Bonnie Blakely is here uh, leading the team at CASA, been here for a couple of years. Caitlin Ebers is here joining us, a clinical manager with the core program, a psychologist with CASA. And Madeline Lowe, a youth and family liaison, but also a success story. Bonnie, it's so good to have the three of you in studio. Thanks for making time for us today. When you hear people talking about a mental health crisis in Alberta, what does that look like from the CEO's desk at CASA? Yeah, great question, Ryan. Thanks for uh, having us join you today. Um, I guess from our perspective, um, mental illness has always been in our communities. But coming through the pandemic, what we've seen is that there's just that incredibly more need than we've seen before. Um, And from where we sit, it's not just that we see more numbers of kids that are needing our service and their families. It's the acuity level that we see in those kids. But also, those kids are not only coming with now a mental health challenge, some of them also are coming with eating challenges, they're coming with addictions. And so we're seeing that it's not just the numbers, it's also the acuity of those kids. Do we just know more about mental health now so we can better diagnose issues or we can better recognize challenges? Or are more young people encountering mental health challenges 
than in past? How much do we know about the numbers? Yeah, I think that's a hard question to answer. I think, first of all, coming through the pandemic, families and kiddos um, recognized, I think, in a different way their needs. And I think the demands increased. I think therapists and um, our psychologists and others have a, a greater ability to diagnose. But I also just think that we're having the conversation more. Um, and having that conversation allows people to probably identify things they hadn't in the past. So it's kind of a combination of a whole bunch of things. Mm. Madeline, when did, when did you first connect with CASA Services? You're, I mean, you're sitting here as a success story. How did your journey begin? So I started having mental health challenges. It's kind of hard to say. Probably I've had ADHD my whole life, but I started really struggling um, in junior high. Um, particularly because I had undiagnosed ADHD and um, I started to fall behind in school. Um, I was often struggling with being on time and getting my assignments in um, and I was having some uh, difficulties at home. My parents had gotten a divorce um, somewhat recently. So I started missing a lot of school. Um, I was feeling really, really low a lot of the time, struggling with a lot of depression, anxiety, um, just really, really struggling. And it started to snowball um, and it just got worse throughout. Like it probably started when I was 12, 13 um, and I didn't have any help at the time. And this was, I'm 25 now, so this was a little over 10 years ago when there weren't as many of these conversations happening. So um, my teachers and my parents, they didn't know how to recognize what was going on, um, but it eventually did get to the point where um, I was uh, taken to mental health services intake um, by my mom, and I was referred over to CASA um, when I was about 15 or 16. Um, and it really did help me to have that service, especially because I think before I was actually doing private therapy and that can really, like the cost of private counseling can really, really add up. It's like usually $200 a session. And I was at that point where I needed to see someone at least once a week or every two weeks. And that's just not affordable to go on for years. So um, that's kind of how I ended up at CASA. Um, I got treatment there and um, I am always careful to not frame my success story as like an I'm cured story um, because I do have really complex mental health challenges. I've dealt with um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder and ADHD and depression. Um, so CASA really, really helped me. Um, and I still um, did do some treatment into my young adulthood. Um, and I joined the Youth and Family Advisory Council when I was about 19. Um, and ended up working at CASA. Yeah, Ryan, I think uh, Madeline's comment is really important to what she just said, which is that a lot of the kids that we work with, they may not ever be in a situation where you can say they were cured, but they can thrive in our communities. And what we've heard from parents and families, and I'm a mom of lived experience. I have two kiddos that have mental illness, and my successes and theirs is that they have this, the, the skills, the tools, and the abilities to work every day, to be positive contributors. And so I think sometimes, you know, Madeline probably underestimates um, how much um, she is a success story because, yes, she still lives with it, but she lives successfully with it. Mm -hmm. huh. do, you, do you know who Lauren Kennedy West is by chance? She's, she's a YouTuber out of Edmonton, and she's got a channel called Living Well with Schizophrenia, and uh, I'm showing it on my screen right now. She, she joined us here in studio just about a month ago, and her whole thing is not that she's cured. She doesn't pretend like she doesn't live with challenges. She doesn't pretend like, like her uh, challenges don't impact her on an almost daily basis, including her relationship with her husband and her family. Uh, her conversation here was so powerful, and I really appreciate your comment in, in pointing that out. Um, how, how common is this uh, you know, um, Caitlin, when, when somebody uh, arrives to CASA and, and notes, I mean, some of these barriers that you've talked about, you, you touched on so many. It's like you were ticking boxes. Mm -hmm. There are barriers to therapy. Money's a big one. Mm -hmm. Stigma is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, you see this every single day. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, thanks for sharing your story with us. I think it really highlights so many important points that our families are facing on a regular basis. First of all, it's extremely expensive to access mental health services. Um, there's often long wait times. Um, a lot of services aren't accessible to, to families. Um, and we're working really, really hard to support these families at CASA and to make our services more accessible. We're, we're, it's part of our journey. You know, we have a five-year road map to try to double our services and part of that is because of stories like Madeline's stories like Bonnie's and, and her family is stories like mine I also have lived experience with mental health challenges and I don't think that we're alone sitting at this table I think everyone I know has a family member a friend a colleague who's struggled with mental health challenges and we know that um, a huge proportion of those challenges start in childhood. And so that's why CASA is really, really important. Hmm. When, when you, uh, you you took this job, CEO, what was it, Bonnie? Like three, four years ago, something like two. that? Two. <laughs> was it two years <laughs> ago? <laughs> just, just as the pandemic was well, doing its thing. <laughs> and, and, and you like you moved your family, right? You were in Saskatchewan. You moved your family to Alberta to take the job. It was obviously a job that you wanted. Did you at the time, I mean, like this 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 bold vision to double services over five years at a time when I mean we talk to advocates we talk to service providers uh, in social services all the time on this show and they talk to us about the challenges around funding and everything else staffing I mean you you name it right did you did you fully know what you were getting into when you arrived in Alberta and, and took this job what, what what were the first couple months like as you assessed the landscape yeah. Well, first of all, I'd say, you know, the bold vision that we have doesn't come from me personally. It comes from our community, our funders, our um, families who are just asking us to step up. And I mean, let's be clear, coming out of the pandemic, when I came to Edmonton and was able to talk to the community and those that we serve, they, more than ever, they said, we need people to be bold right now. And yes, there's all sorts of barriers to this. But the one thing we know, and probably all of us at this table can talk about it, is that when you're struggling with mental illness and there's a lack of resources, Resources, the one thing you want is hope and what we said is it is time to give families hope and yes we're gonna run into all sorts of barriers in doubling these numbers but if we can tell families we're gonna make every effort to be there I can tell you as, a, as someone who's you know been in that situation just knowing that um, that we're going to make an effort would have helped our family and so yeah we didn't know exactly what we were necessarily getting into and the double the number you know it I, I'll tell you honestly in talking to parents and families they want us to triple or quadruple mm -hmm. there's others you know and so you know doubling is our goal but if we can do more than that we will and so that our goal is to focus on the purpose of what Casa Mental Health does to deliver services and then we believe that people will come along and help us with that. Uh, Caitlin yeah, how important is it to have specific a specific or customized approach for when when we talk about like child, mm -hmm. youth, adolescent, mm -hmm. family supports. Can, can you, I mean, you're a psychologist, this is what you do. Can yeah. you give us a sense of, of how important it is to have customized or specific supports for, yeah. for young people, for yeah. children? Absolutely. I think the word that comes to mind for me is comprehensive. So we want to look at the holistic child. We want to um, look at where they are develop developmentally. We want to look at where they are cognitively. We want to look at some past experience. I mean, we've touched on um, some complex PTSD. So maybe they've experienced trauma in their past. Um, we've talked about coming out of a pandemic. So um, there's multiple factors that can impact um, how we would diagnose and then how we would create a treatment plan for these families. And so it's really important to have that comprehensive um, assessment and evaluation of what's happening for that child. Um, and, you know, in my program at, at CASA, we, we use a, a transdisciplinary approach, which looks like bringing people from um, multiple fields. So we have um, child and adolescent psychiatry, we have occupational therapy, we have psychologists, we have social workers, um, we have um, nurses, and we everybody is trained. We have speech language pathologists, um, support. So everyone on the team is trained in child, um, child and adolescent mental health, um, but we work from multiple disciplines. And so you get a really complex and comprehensive approach to supporting these kids. Um, and you don't get that a lot of places. What did COVID do? to all of this like how did COVID impact all of this well I mean I mean honestly the struggle with it was that you know with social distancing and having to mask and all those things we had to reduce the number of kids we were actually serving yeah. we had to move to online platforms right. which worked with some kids but not others I think you know and I think actually it built additional need because we just weren't getting to as many kids and so here's the thing about kids 
it is about timely intervention. If we want to prevent further, um, you know, either erosion of their health um, or ha them having to do a higher level of service, we need to intervene at the right time. And with, and I feel, you know, just again, my lived experience and then with what we're doing at CAS is that we missed a lot of those opportunities yeah. because we couldn't get kids through the door. And so, yeah. you know, the pandemic created, you know, that tsunami that's coming after, which is this mental health crisis, um, because it's just this pent up two or three years of people needing service. And with those kids, what we know, especially when they're young, if we intervene when they're young, we can make huge inroads with them and their families. We don't, even two or three years later, now you've just got additional things to have to manage. Yeah, that's exactly right. And Bonnie, you started by talking about hope. And one of the things that's really hard to maintain hope is when you're in isolation. And so we, had, we took a lot of people and put them into these isolated situations. And when you're struggling with mental health already, and then you're completely alone and disconnected from your social network, from the people that you care about, and you're not able to have those social connections, it really heightens um, those symptoms and and you start to lose hope and that's that's really scary how does a parent you're, you're gonna have a lot of people that are gonna check out this podcast or they're mm -hmm. gonna watch this on YouTube it might be their first time checking out real talk but they see that we're talking about mental health in young people and so there's gonna be parents or caregivers or grandparents or what have you out there that are wondering when is it time to consult a professional mm -hmm. like when is it time to note a, a young person's struggles and realize that maybe even the supports from well-meaning and deeply loving family members could be accentuated or mm -hmm. bolstered or helped out with some professional help how do you know when it's time to reach out I think if you're asking that question you know I really believe in that that connection that parents and caregivers and grandparents have with their kids and they know them really well um, um, and so I think when they're asking that question, there's something, uh, listen to your intuition. There's something inside of you that's saying, this, this isn't right. My child needs help. And we can, um, I'm a parent as well. And, and Bonnie's talked about her experience as a parent. And my parents, when I was a teen, they advocated for me. Um, and so I think, I really believe in that, um, that intuition. When you, when you're, when you know, you really can feel it. Uh, Madeline, what was it? Do you remember like when you, when you first showed up, do you remember your first session? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I honestly remember my first, first session, but I remember what it was like as a teen going to therapy for the first time. And I actually, it's surprising to me to look back now because now I'm a huge advocate, obviously, for mental health services and destigmatizing mental health, but I was actually a little bit resistant to it. And I remember telling my mom, like, no, I don't want to miss school and go to therapy. Like, I'm not mentally ill. I'm not like those people who are, have mental illness. I'm not like that. And I remember feeling kind of ashamed actually going to therapy. Mm. Um, but... I my mom pushed me to keep going um, and I'm really glad that she did because I eventually kind of got over the stigma and learned to accept it um, and yeah so it was it was an interesting start for me I, I'm sure that a lot of youth and parents too um, have that hesitation sometimes when they're first starting um, to access mental health services. Dude, oh, I, I have friends that are hesitant yeah, yeah. to start. I mean, I, you know, I was hesitant to start at mm -hmm. one point. And, and I, but I do feel like, do you feel like stigmas kind of like in some circumstances anyway, like melting away a little bit? Like, well, I feel like we're making some progress. People talking about therapy and normalizing therapy is a very good thing. 100%. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I, 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 and I credit our youth. I have to say, we hear from our youth all the time and they will tell us it is not them that is stigmatizing it. And I think many of us who grew up in an era where it was, we're the ones that continue to do that. Yeah. They, you know, when we talk to our youth, they're all the time. And you'll see in CASA, we talk now about mental illness because, you know, when we think about our services, when we think about doubling those number, you know, we're, you know, we appreciate that we have partners that do prevention, promotion and primary care, but we don't do that. We actually deal with kids who have mental illness and we use that terminology now and it was our our kids who we serve that said start using the words if we had cancer and we went to the doctor and they diagnosed us with stage one cancer we go tell somebody that but you diagnose us with mental illness and we walk out and say mental health why you're making it the ah. stigma not us and so they're saying own those words and so you'll see Cass has taken a really bold move in that we talk about mental illness all the time that's the kids we work with and it's okay to be diagnosed with a mental illness just like being diagnosed with cancer or anything else and that's the services we provide 
And I love that the youth said, they challenged us. They said, stop doing this to us. You, you, you diagnose us with an illness and then you talk about health. We all have health challenges without a doubt, physical, mental, you know, all those things. And we all should go to the gym and we should do breathing and all that. But that's not the kids we're working with. Hmm. Our kids have diagnosed mental illness and they're okay with that if we're able to say we're okay with that. So yeah. I actually love our youth. I think our youth are going to change us generationally to actually, they're going to be the ones who destigmatize it because they're willing to own it. You know, I, I, I talk about firefighters a lot on the show because like mm -hmm. half my friends are firefighters and, uh, and they were talking to me about some of the advancements that have been made culturally uh, on the fire department and among first responders where they actually will sit around the table in the fire hall after a bad call and talk about it and they didn't used to and you know what they told me was one of the biggest things was the language they started using they started calling it a mental health injury because they said on the fire department if you blow out your knee or if you blow out your back on a call you're injured yeah. and nobody judges you for that but if you're dealing with ptsd relating to your job why would you not call it an injury and one of my friends told me that it was easier for him to hit his head on when he started recognizing it was an injury. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, and I, I just think sometimes so much it's about us just listening to those who have the experiences who say, listen, like we're not, you know, we want help and we want to be able to talk about this. And you know what, if we can talk about it in a way that people understand, it opens up the conversations differently. Mm -hmm. And so it was, and you know, again, I, to your credit of, of firefighters and others, if you're willing to have those in a different way, um, and again, why is there stigma? And you'll probably have heard this in, in the work, you know, in terms of the work that we're doing with kiddos with suicidal, you know, ideations and stuff. The, the challenge is this, even with suicide, we usually talk about, you know, so how did they die? Well, they committed suicide. No, they didn't commit suicide. They died of suicide, mm -hmm. just like other health-related things that we die of. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that suicide often is the result of a mental illness. And so we aren't dying because we committed suicide. We're dying because we had a mental illness and it was chronic and we ended up taking our lives. We always get yeah. the, you know, it, it seems like every time and it just reiterates the fact that this is a is a perpetual and recurring uh, and very real issue. But it seems like before serious conversations like this, there's always an, an event or something in the news mm -hmm. that reminds us of the importance of this. I referenced the, the March 16th murders of those two Edmonton police officers by a 16 year old so say police who obviously was struggling with mental health issues i read yesterday that an 11 year old in the care of the province died by suicide an 11 year old it's one of if i remember off the top of my head 13 deaths with young people in the province's care i mean these 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 are issues that demand our collective attention uh, madeline now so here you are what did you say you're 24 25 i'm 25 like you're you're you know you're still like this is great because young people that come in can relate to you almost in a way as like a bit of, they might look to you as like a bit of an older sister, I would imagine. <laughs> People start looking at me and they start looking at me, you know, like I'm 25 years past that. But I mean, <laughs> but I mean, you now are in a really, really neat and powerful position, carrying a, a lot of responsibility um, as an employee at CASA uh, uh, who coordinates the Youth and Family Advisory Council. Uh, what does that entail? So our Youth and Family Advisory Council is made up of parents and family members of uh, children or youth who've accessed mental health services, um, as well as youth who've accessed mental health services, either at CASA or, or similar services. Um, and they provide feedback to CASA and input about our programs and services based on their lived experience. Um, and it's really important to consult people with lived experience because sometimes we have a different perspective that might be missed by professionals who also have um, really, really important and valuable expertise. And a lot of professionals have lived experience as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's important, especially at CASA, to listen to that lived experience voice. Ryan, there's Absolutely. one of the things that sets CASA apart. Yeah. And again, I'm just going to say this as a, a parent of lived experience. Never when I was raising my kids did I ever see a service like CASA. Because what CASA Mental Health does is that we don't just wrap around the child. We wrap around the entire family. And so our goal is to make sure that not only that child gets what they need, but if they have siblings who are struggling or family members, and sometimes it's even the community that we reach out beyond. Because again, you know what we said about them thriving in community? What that means is that their family has to have the tools to help them thrive when they're not with us anymore because you don't want them to be with us for a lifetime we want to give them the skills and tools and then and set them free so that mm -hmm. they can be in the mm -hmm. community right Caitlin yeah absolutely
absolutely. We need that network of support. So we work with a lot of partners um, and community organizations, and we have a real um, network of support that we try to wrap around these families. I'm looking at yeah. the website right now, CasaMentalHealth.org, mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. and we'll have that in the show notes on the podcast, on YouTube. Uh, again, CasaMentalHealth.org, help for a three to five year old, help for a five to 17 year old, different programs, different supports, different options. On the bottom, these keys, and we're familiar with these types of keys on websites relating to emergency shelters, relating to domestic violence. One of them, uh, a button to click for immediate help, and another one, Mm -hmm. a quick exit, which when you hit it, it'll Mm -hmm. take you right off the website and back to the Google search engine. You can't hit the back button. Uh, I understand why that's necessary when it comes to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody, uh, you know, trying to plan out their exit to save their lives or the lives of maybe some young ones in the house. Mm -hmm. Why is that necessary on on a mental health support site? Well, I think that the the sad fact is there still is some stigma around mm. mental illness and mental health challenges. And so I I think of teens who might be in unhealthy relationships and they're looking for support and maybe their partner doesn't think that that's a good idea for them and they need to quickly get off that page um, so that they don't get seen or um Children who live in families where maybe their parents really don't agree that that is something that their child requires. Maybe they are still carrying um, shame or stigma around mental illness. And so um, that child's eagerly looking for information, but quickly needs to get off the page um, so as not to be seen. So yeah, that's we, part of the work that, that we're doing going forward is to try and remove some of that stigma. Yeah, we have um, some youth on our council actually that are... Um, I've heard from actually a lot of youth um, who have parents who aren't necessarily um, supportive of them accessing mental health services. Um, And the stigma is still there. I think like circling back to that stigma conversation, we've reduced a lot of the stigma, but there's still a lot of stigma to do with kind of that missing middle with mental illness. We see so much talk about like self-care and mild depression and anxiety and and things like that. And that's really important, but we're not seeing, at least I'm not seeing, and it's a conversation we have a lot on the Youth and Family Advisory Council and with CASA. We're just not seeing as much of that stigma reduction attention going to the less palatable parts of mental health, like mental illness, like depression, you know, maybe someone with depression who can't go out of bed, they're struggling with their basic hygiene. It's it's not pretty and it's not something you can put into a nice Instagram infographic with yep. pastel colors. <laughs> yeah. 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 No kidding. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful that these conversations are happening. Um, I'm, I'm proud to join you on this mission to fundraise and to deepen and broaden the supports, uh, the mental health supports uh, across the province of Alberta. And I, I want to, uh, in particular, give a bit of a shout out to an inaugural event that's happening. It's coming up on Thursday, July 27th. That's this summer. And this is a big shout out to anybody. Real talkers, you can be in Calgary and Edmonton. It's just an hour drive. We'd love for you to make a day of it. But in particular, our audience members and our friends in Red Deer and through Central Alberta. You know how beautiful the Alberta Springs Golf Resort is. I love that track. On Thursday, July 27th, we're all going to be there for the inaugural Red Deer Golf Classic in support of CASA. Now, the CASA Golf Classic has gone and has a long and storied uh, tradition in Edmonton. You know, even since 2016, that's not that long ago. They've raised more than three quarters of a million dollars Uh, to support many programs and initiatives like the CASA Research Chair, the Winter Wonderland activities. You can learn more about that on CASA's website. But we would love to sell this thing out. We know we're going to sell it out, but we'd love to have you there with us. That's Thursday, July 27th at Alberta Springs. It's a beautiful golf course uh, just between Red Deer and Sylvan Lake. I'm so excited to be hosting it, and we'd love to see you there, Real Talkers. We have the link in our uh, live chat right now on YouTube, and if you're listening later, if you're streaming this, thanks for doing that. You can find it in the show notes on the podcast and on YouTube. How's your golf game, Bonnie, by the way? Oh, I've been practicing. (laughs) Okay, you can be up they're swinging the sticks. Oh, I'm gonna. Uh, well, in Edmonton, maybe they'll do it in Red Deer too. I'm gonna be on a hole, and I'm gonna see if anyone can outdrive me. Oh, I like it. Oh yeah, dollar for dollar. Let's go. Then let's Bonnie go. is uh, very competitive. I don't know if you can <laughs> about her. That's great. Oh, yeah. I love it. I can smash the ball, but I just can't hit fairways. So that's my problem. <laughs> that's my problem. The Red Deer Golf Classic on Thursday, July 27th. That's uh, Bonnie Blakely, uh, Caitlin Ebers, and uh, Madeline Lowe joining us here in studio. Thanks for what you do. 
I mean, literally saving lives, uh, improving people's quality of life, uh, you know, keeping relationships together, helping people navigate choppy waters. Uh, you know, it, it really, uh, from someone who knows people personally that have tapped into these supports um, and making new friends here around the table as well means a lot. You can find more on what CASA does by following the links in the show notes. And of course, this round table, this Real Talk round table is presented by our friends at Urban Timber, reclaimed wood company. You can find them online at urbantimber.ca. I talked to you a lot about the boxcar collection. You can view that online. You know what's even a better idea is going to check out the Urban Timber boxcar collection in person. Yeah, that's right. They have a beautiful West Edmonton showroom. If you happen to be in our neck of the woods, they're open Saturdays uh, from 10 to 4. You can check out more at urbantimber.ca. But this is a collection crafted from reclaimed rail car planks that have traveled millions of miles across North America. You can check out the story online. These are one-of-a-kind pieces. I mean, they're sourcing these planks from rail cars, so you've got the dings and the dents and the scuffs and the scrapes and the scratches, and then that's when the Urban Timber team takes over. They completely clean and sand and fill with epoxy, finish with a food-safe coating these planks, leaving each custom table unique. You will never see two that are alike. Now, of course, you can do end tables with this, boardroom tables with this. Heck, they do flooring, wall paneling, shelving, like some of the shelves in our Real Talk studio. Beautiful work by the team at Urban Timber at urbantimber.ca. We also wanted to talk to you a little bit about Kubi Renewable Energy this morning. You know, the team at Kubi is gearing up for spring, and in a big way, they're hiring. Okay? Would you like to work in a place like this? If you're watching this on YouTube, check this out. This is Team Kubi on their way through the mountains to complete another solar install. Are you an EV driver? Could you maybe use a charging wall in your home or maybe even at your workplace? Nobody does it better than Kubi. Of course, you can also remember that with these clean solar installs, like what you're seeing here and what you can see on their website at kubienergy.ca, you're guaranteed to have the best professionals in the business completing this work. You don't want somebody who doesn't know what they're doing up on your roof running wiring. It goes without saying, nobody does more solar installations in Western Canada than Kubi Renewable Energy. And right now they can help you tap into that Canada Greener Homes Grant. That's that interest-free loan up to 40 grand from the feds, 10 years to pay it back so you can get solar up on your roof this spring. Hey, speaking of hiring, that's the main message that our friends at Apex Automation want to get out right now. You can check them out online at apexautomation.ca. The hiring link, you can learn more about the careers that lie in wait with this company that has tripled the size of its team in the last few years. Uh, across North America, professionals with Apex are starting to install and, of course, design automation systems in autonomous vehicles and machinery. They're doing a lot of work in agricultural, in resource mining. They're doing a ton of work in robotics, remote terminal units, maybe out on the West Coast, terminal management, alarm management, that's across industry, of course, and packaged solutions. When you deal with Apex, your automation system is designed and tested at their headquarters before it's installed to make the process more seamless and more cost effective for everybody. They train your team with the amazing members on their team, and they have satisfied customer after satisfied customer across North America. If you're a professional engineer or a technician looking for a change of pace, a company that puts people over profits, make the smart move and check out apexautomation.ca today. We talked a lot about automation just a few days ago. It was our March 28th episode of Real Talk when we welcomed labor economist Dr. Joseph Marchand to the show. He dug into some of the research he's been doing, number one, around Alberta's $15 an hour minimum wage and the impact that that's had since it first started to go up about five years ago. And then he talked a lot about why the boom in the resource sector, in the energy sector, isn't translating into as many jobs as you might think it would. He got into what's different about this boom than the one in the 70s and the one in the early 2000s. And he made some interesting and compelling points. It also prompted an email that I read on the show yesterday from a real talker by the name of Mark, who said he wasn't sure that he bought what the professor was selling. 
Mark said he's pretty sure that uh, big oil companies and other energy extraction companies aren't sketched out by the federal government. They're not just sending profits back to shareholders because they don't have confidence in infrastructure projects. It's because they're holding their cards close to their chest. They're waiting and seeing. And of course, Mark referred us to a piece in the Financial Post written by Diane Francis, published on March 27th. The headline reads, Alberta on the cusp of another resource boom. Now, if you were us, what would be your obvious next move? Of course, it would be to reach out to Diane Francis to get her take on exactly what's going on. And so that's what we did. And we're thrilled that she's made time to join us. Diane Francis is an expert on Canada, the U.S., Canada-U.S. relations, future tech, geopolitics, and more. She's an award-winning columnist, a best-selling author, an investigative journalist, and editor-at-large at Canada's National Post. It's nice to see you here on Real Talk. And thanks so much for making time for us. Happy to be here. Yeah. So what do you make of this assertion? Dr. Marchand says to us right now, big oil companies, despite the fact that they're making healthy profits, they just don't have confidence in the future of the industry to roll out big infrastructure projects. And that's hurting the job market. Do you feel differently? Well, I, I, you know, there's a lot of things that, <clears throat> excuse me, come to play. Uh, the, the, the lithium story, which we're going to talk about shortly, is a completely out of uh, out of the blue sky story that fell in my lap when I was in Washington, D.C., moderating a panel at a think tank about critical minerals, lithium and all these other things that we need to make computers and electric vehicles and so on. And they're expensive and they're rare. And, you know, but the oil industry, the conventional oil industry in Canada is very much like everybody else in a wait and see mode because of the war in Ukraine, because the Russians fooled around with the oil prices, pulled back their supplies, made the price skyrocket. And now there's oil price caps imposed on oil. So that's brought the price down again. So, you know, you don't you can't make plans unless you know where the oil price is going to go. And so, you know, they're they're very prudent and they're careful and how they spend their money and, you know, I think they're doing just fine. Um, I think that pipelines are a problem because the federal government is anti-resource. I think building pipelines and transmission lines, for that matter, for electricity, are becoming a bigger and bigger problem in Canada because of the Trudeau government. But uh, I think it's, it's it's a pretty healthy industry. The lithium story is a whole other ballgame. And I want to preface, before you start asking me questions, that I am not an investment advisor, okay? (laughs) And in full disclosure, I'm an ethical journalist. I came across this story. I thought it was amazing. Doesn't mean it's going to really happen the way it's possible. And so I do not, and and I don't own the stock. I don't own the stocks of anything I write about. So, So that's important to get off. So Go ahead and ask me your question. Well, I do like this, and I do want to point out that at DianeFrancis.com, you let everybody know that you are, in fact, anti-stupidity, well, which is always a positive attribute for any guest that's going to appear on a talk show. But I will say, in your column in the Financial Post, people can read it. It was out just a few days ago. I mean, you invoke the legacy of Leduc Number 1 in talking about lithium. I mean, that that's a hell of a comparison to make. And and I know that you're grabbing your reader's attention, but do you really think that the future of, of lithium and, 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 and these resource extraction, I mean, let me say this. Let me back up for one quick second. We talked to former U.S. ambassador to Canada, uh, Bruce Heyman, on the show just a couple of days ago uh, in the context of, of President Biden's visit to Canada. And I do want to ask you about that, Diane. But, but he was bullish on the future of uh, Canada-U.S. relations in the context of lithium and high hydrogen in particular he's really big on that and your column would suggest that you see a bright future there too well i don't think he he realized uh, what i'm writing about there is uh, lithium in ontario and quebec but it's what they call hard rock lithium which means you use traditional mining methods which are environmentally difficult and hugely expensive what this fellow this geologist chris Dornbus of calgary has come across is he's come across with a brilliant idea. And I opened the article by saying, and you know, Montreal and Toronto and Ottawa and even New York do not understand it. The most important date in the 20th century of Canada's economic history took place 
February 13, 1947, on a farm near Edmonton, when Imperial found Leduc One. Leduc is also been given the name to the geological formation that they tapped into when they drilled that hole. That geological formation covers about 15% of the province of Alberta. And this geologist, Chris Durmbus, took a look at the geological stuff and said, you know what, I think this probably copper because when you produce oil, you also produce water, which you separate from the oil and re-inject into the ground. In the leftover water, he says, I bet you there's copper. Well, he didn't find copper, but he found lithium, which is exponentially more valuable than copper, ounce for ounce. And he has tested, I think, a number of wells. He's looked at the old logging reports, which Alberta duly keeps on every drill, every oil well that's drilled. And, and indeed, this could be the mother load of lithium discoveries. And to boot, we know where it is, so you don't have to drill more for it. Secondly, it is environmentally much easier to produce because you just go back into the wells, pump up the leftover water, separate the lithium, and re-inject the water again. So it's minimal and it's dramatically less expensive. He, yeah. has, he has figures that if his theory, and they he's and by the way, he's backstopped by the biggest oil company in the world, Exxon. 5% of his company, which is called E3 Lithium, is backstopped by Imperial Oil, which in turn is owned by Exxon. And they are there and they're helping with feasibility and all kinds of other advice. And of course, they still own much of the Leduc formation oil fields and lands in leases and freehold. So they're partners. And so he's got a big money, par money bags partner who knows what they're doing. And they're looking at um, a staggering amount of lithium that would rival what, what Australia produces and what is produced in South America. And this is not going to happen overnight. They have to build a feasibility plant and so on. But he's got deep pockets. He's got Exxon behind him. I don't want to, I mean, I, I hope you're cool with conversations that swerve around a little bit because that's kind of how we roll here. But I mean, you invoke Imperial Oil, obviously an, an enormous uh, corporation, a global corporation, multi-billion, yada, yada, yada. Everybody knows about Imperial Oil. Uh, when I think of Imperial Oil right now, I think of their curl uh, production facility, the oil sands facility, where that nine month leak, that, that tailings pond leak was discovered a while ago. And Alberta's Auditor General has just released a report that's pretty damning uh, with the Alberta Energy Regulator and Imperial in its crosshairs how bad is a story we know how bad it is for the water we know how bad it is for the land we know how how chief alan adam and the athabasca fort chippewan first nation feels about it but how bad is that for industry with regards to i don't know if you like or dislike the phrase social license but everyone you got to call it it is a thing how bad is that story well lithium lithium is the new economy transition story this is this is what will power electric vehicle revolution uh, computers, cell phones, lithium is in great demand. So this this would position, if, if it comes true, this would position Alberta at the forefront of the rare earths and other metals minerals that we need for the, the transition economy. Now, the other thing I want to say is that oil and gas is, is going to be, oil in particular, oil is going to be with us for the next 80 years. The transition to the oil industry is not renewable, is not renewables because they can't be relied on for base load and electricity and so on. Lots of different reasons. Sun doesn't always shine. Wind doesn't always blow, yada, yada, yada. But what you do have to have is gas. Natural gas is the transition um, fuel uh, until the world can get off oil, if in fact it ever does. So, you know, I'm not one of these uh, diehard climate change types that, you know, says we've got to, you know, damn the torpedoes and do whatever we can. It is oil and gas makes the world go round. And the, the developing countries rely on oil and gas because they can't build solar panels or nuclear plants or dams, you know. So that's sort of my big, that's my overview of the world's energy uh, situation. And I think there's, there's no shame Canada should not be ashamed of being a resource-based economy. I've been in the mining business. I was on two publicly listed gold mine boards. You know, it's it's not a dirty word. It provides a legal 
substance and fluids that the world needs and will need for decades to come. Yeah. And I know, I mean, you and I could debate this and I, I maybe we land in the same place. I get a lot of friends that work in oil and gas. Oil and gas has driven this economy for, you know, I don't know, the better part of 75 years. But I also just think that the the the, the disasters that happen uh, impacting the environment sort of fly in the face if they're not taken seriously around that whole argument around ethical oil. But I digress. People have their own opinions on that. We can talk about that for a long time. I've noticed that you've invoked the word transition several times. You obviously don't feel like that's a dirty word. You just talked about the transition economy, but a lot of people are up in arms about the so-called just transition. What do you make of the pushback when we talk about Alberta diversifying its economy or preparing for what the future opportunities might look like? Well, the green the greens uh, have a different definition of transition than than people that know what they're talking about do. The greens say transition means everybody has solar panels and windmills. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. And all the hydropower that's been can be developed in Canada and most of the world has been. And people don't want nuclear plants. Greenpeace hates nuclear plants. Zero emissions. I mean, it's crazy. So those people are radical, and they're not very bright when it comes to how the world really has to work to work properly. The transition fuel, the transition is going to happen as the world goes to nuclear and natural gas, period, end of story. That's what's going to happen. What do you think, what role do governments play here? We know it goes without saying, I mean, who knows what's going to happen at the end of May with the provincial election. Uh, My guess is that Daniel Smith's going to hold on and that the conservatives are going to win, but crazier things have happened. You never know. So the future, by the way, I like Daniel. She's very smart. Uh, She's got a big PR problem right now with this Arthur Pavlovsky video. Uh, What do you like about her? Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to get into the, 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 you know, the, down the rabbit hole of Alberta local politics. All I'm saying is that I know her. She worked with me as a journalist. She is very smart. She knows all the issues and she's very articulate and her heart's in the right spot. And she wants to do the best for Alberta within Confederation because right now uh, everybody's winked out in letting the feds do what they do to Alberta. Yeah, so let me ask you when you talk when you talk about that, I was I was making the point that yeah, who knows what's going to happen at the end of May, and 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 that could of course de- depending on who the premier is uh, dictate the position that the provincial government takes on supporting uh, the resource economy, supporting oil and gas, etc. But with regards to the federal government, I mean, assuming that the NDP doesn't walk away its support uh, for the Trudeau Liberals, they are going to be in power for the next while. What would you expect to see, and what would represent in your mind the appropriate support? or response from a federal government in the context of this, what we're talking about, lithium and other potential opportunities in Alberta? Lithium is 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 God is a godsend. It's a green godsend. If Alberta, in fact, can supply, you know, a chunk of the world's lithium, which is in short supply now, then you can more rapidly make the movement to electric vehicles and you can electrify everything. Uh, this is a metal that is uh, very rare and it, it's very light and it, it has it has the capacity to conduct electricity faster than any other metal in the world. That's why it's it's in great demand. So this would be terrific. Now there's another mine in Quebec that's you know it's a hard rock mine uh, that that but it's not a competitor. This is this is a global commodity play, and uh, so you know I the feds have. And the feds, you know, we're going to see this play out. The feds really have no business snooping around what Alberta does with its resources or Ontario. Diane Francis is editor at large of the National Post. And this is your Real Talk debut. It's great to connect with you. I appreciate you making yourself available. If people want to check out your column, they can find it at financialpost.com, published March 27th. That was a couple of days ago. Alberta on the cusp of another resource boom. Thanks for doing this. You're more than welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Appreciate that. You can read more about uh, Diane by checking out dianefrancis.com. Let us know what you think about this. You've got two very different perspectives on what's happening in Alberta's uh, resource economy. And of course, I'm using that as kind of as broad a phrase as possible. That could include oil and gas. Uh, Of course, that includes lithium. Very interesting. Hydrogen. A lot of people are going to want to talk about these and explore these different avenues. And we'll continue to bring you diverse opinions on the show to help you form your own positions on that. Uh, Before we get to Trash Talk, presented by Local Environmental Services, that's coming up in just a few minutes. I've got a couple of other emails. They don't qualify as Trash Talk, but they're really good. 
close. And I wanted to get now these these are actually there's one that's a very serious one. It's 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 about the fallen officers. And Cheryl is a real talker that takes a position. I don't think she's alone on this one, but it's it's a sensitive one. And uh, if you can't have those conversations, if we can't read those emails on a show like this, where can we read them? And so I'm grateful that Cheryl took the time to send us that email. That's coming up in just a quick second. You know, we're talking a lot about power and a lot about utilities. It's a great opportunity for me to remind you about our proud partnership with the friendly local utilities provider that is Park Power, providing internet, natural gas, and electricity services across the province of Alberta. Park Power has been with us since day one, powering our Real Talk RJ hashtag. I love their community partner program where they share 10% of their electricity profits with deserving charities. 10%. What other big power companies doing that? The answer is none of them. The cool part is when you take your business to Park Power, you get to choose from a long list which of the community partners, which of the nonprofits of the charities you want to support with your business. That's exactly what we did as a family. We had that discussion. We made our choice and it made us even more proud to take our business to Park Power. They've also got a solar club program where they're going to pay you more than the big guys for the excess energy your solar panels are producing in the summer months. If you want to bundle your services with Park Power, you're going to save more money than just with their low rates because they've got a great promo code right now running through this year. Real Talk 23 is the promo code you want to use. 50 bucks off your first bill for each of the services you go with. So if you go internet, electricity, natural gas, that's $150 off your first bill. The promo code Real Talk 23 at parkpower.ca. Hey, you like our studio? Hey, you like the look of this studio? I dig it. I dig it, John. You know who <laughs> built this bad boy? I did. <laughs> no, you didn't. I know. I had help. But you did do all the clean installs on all the lights and the cameras and the speakers and the wiring. And... 80% custom care, 20% Johnny Infants. Okay, so Complete Care Restoration does like 80 80- can I say 90%? The hard stuff. And then Johnny Infamous comes in and drops the cherry on top of the Sunday. But you Boom. wouldn't, in all seriousness, you wouldn't have been able to run. How many kilometers of wires do you think and cables are up in our ceiling right now? I don't want a fire inspector to come in. I'll just say a lot. I say there's I a lot. I won't give an exact They're number. all properly installed. <laughs> yes. But they wouldn't be in the ceiling if we didn't have complete care restoration in here ahead of time. Taking a look at a pesky, nasty water leak. Doesn't mix well with the electronics. I said, you guys think you're going to be able to handle this? And they just smiled at us. Of course, they repair fire damage, flood damage. They get rid of mold. They get rid of asbestos. Our project was a piece of cake for these guys. And boy, did they hit it out of the park. They can do the same for you. If you encounter an absolute nightmare, make Complete Care Restoration your first call at 780-454-0776. Now, if the disaster you're dealing with is more just a boring backyard or some lame tree that's going to take 35 years to grow into anything remotely resembling a shade provider, I'm not trying to Trees are awesome. Yeah, yeah, trees are awesome, John, but sometimes you don't have the 30 years you need to get the tree producing apples. They're so (laughs) slow, dagnabbit. This is where you need to place the call to Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping. They're bringing outdoor spaces to life. And we told you about this super cool story that we had heard about earlier this week. It was a real talker by the name of Monique. And uh, so she reaches out to Mike. She had heard about Eden Landscaping on the show, right? And so she's a member of a gardening club, which was super cool. And so she reached out to Eden Landscaping and she said, hey, I was wondering if maybe you guys might be able to connect with our gardening club and give us some feedback on some of our, you know, amateur design work that we're doing. So Mike and his colleague Andrea show up and they sit down with these 20 enthusiastic gardeners at the Avonmore Community League Hall, shout out to Avonmore, for a landscaping workshop. They took them through their designs. They helped them maybe envision some tweaks or some next level changes they could make. And each one of those amateur hobby gardeners got 10 minutes to sit down one-on-one with the pros. How cool is that? That's what a family-owned business offers. A business that really gives a rip about how happy you are, how satisfied you are with the job they do. We only partner with clients, companies, sponsors that we're willing to put our name on 
and that includes the team at Eden Landscaping. You can get a free quote today at landscapeedmonton.ca. They give a rip. You think maybe they'd change their slogan? I was just going to say, because we were talking about taglines yesterday. Yeah. That'd be a great one. We well, give a rip. What was the tagline yesterday for auto? It was eat, eat with people you love or something like that? Uh, eat, eat where you eat with people you love or something like that? I loved that conversation. It was great. Yeah, there was a real I talk to steal that yesterday. Tagline, yeah. You can steal it. Yeah. Talk with people you love. That yeah. could be our new uh, Real talk. Talk with people you love. Are you going to start with this EPS email? Is no, I was going to get... I was gonna, what, what did you want to talk well, about? Well, I just wanted to touch on the fact that it was, it was, it was pretty moving the uh the procession that came by here we didn't have a chance to talk about it because things got kind of busy this week but yeah we had no idea how many men and women in law enforcement were going to be out on the street and when we actually opened the window and i'll just give you a, this is right outside this our was studio like we were both kind of lost our breath i mean and it was it got pretty emotional in the studio just you and me watching this and yeah, like thousands and thousands and thousands as far of as the police officers. It, Under, it of course, the two uh, pretty, in, pretty insane ladder trucks with the uh, the Canadian flags and, yeah. uh, and, and and when the hearses went by as well, that was. Uh, when you see something like that, a hearse under a, a police escort, these are the colleagues of these uh, fallen officers and. Uh, yeah, I and just, obviously, I just heard you say "Wow," and then I looked out the window too, and it was just—it was really breathtaking, and it kind of just—it just—I don't know. Everything just kind of hit home for me. Like we'd been talking about it all week, but it really, it really, really hit the nail on the head seeing everyone out there. And I could just, tell it just I mean, how much it affects the community, yeah, at, at large. You know, so yeah, it really does. Uh, we spoke on uh, March seventeenth. Uh, so this is the day after the shootings with uh, a real talker by the name of John Kirkman. Uh, he's a former RCMP officer. He's a former EMT. His wife is a paramedic. She flies with stars. Uh, she works down in Masquachese, uh, south of Edmonton, north of Red Deer. Uh, and um, he has had a, a remarkable experience through the course of his policing, not in a good way. Uh, he's lost four personal friends and colleagues six in total including the four police officers killed in mayor thorpe he was down there in mayor thorpe as an emt at the time he had his application in with the rcs when james roscoe murdered those four officers he then lost a colleague in wetaskiwin in a motor vehicle crash in a marked police cruiser and then his colleague in saint albert constable david Wynn, was shot and killed outside the apex casino john talked to us about his unique perspective and how first responders navigate loss like this and continue to do the job that they do. Everybody's had the blue lights on on their homes and people have blue ribbons on lamp standards and so should they. So should the community to remember uh, Constables Travis Jordan and Brett Ryan. But people have conflicting feelings in some circumstances and that includes Cheryl who sent us this email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. She says, I want to thank you for the March 17th episode of Real Talk. It was great commentary. She says, but I've been struggling, I'm going to be honest, um, over this last week in particular with the massive collective tributes to the fallen officers. The loss is tragic, and loss of life in the professional role of protecting the public is impactful. She says, I just, are we zealously being insensitive to those who generally didn't feel the protection of the blue ribbon? How do we as a society grieve the loss of two young men while also creating space to recognize that their profession has issues, issues that make it hard for those who are not part of colonial privilege? She said what Charles Adler said on your show recently as a tribute was thoughtful. Uh, she's talking about our March 27th, this Monday's episode. And she says, and, and maybe, I don't know, it, maybe it just rubbed me a little bit the wrong way because I don't know if it's inclusive or fair to all people who reside on our soil to say that those who wear a uniform are a special status of honor. Cheryl says, I appreciate that now is not the time 
to raise issues around police harms. That would also be insensitive. But the balance right now, are we finding it? Says Cheryl, I don't know. You can respond to that if you like to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We want these conversations that challenge us. We want these conversations that demand us to consider factors that might be unpopular, that might feel insensitive, and of course to approach them in a way that shows that empathy and perpetual curiosity that we promise to bring you here on the show every single weekday. Again, you can hit us up on Twitter, Real Talk RJ. You can leave a comment on our YouTube videos. We appreciate those as well. I wanted to give a shout out to a Real Talker who had checked out our show about two weeks ago. Uh, This was our episode on the private school scandal in Saskatoon. Remember this one, of course. This is that $25 million class action lawsuit targeting Legacy Christian Academy. And uh, we had Caitlin Erickson on the show talking to us about that. Her house was set on fire, allegedly, after she started uh, essentially acting as a spokesperson on behalf of these more than 50 students who have come forward alleging abuse, uh, in some circumstances, physical and sexual abuse over a number of decades at this school. Well, Hope took the time to leave a comment on our YouTube episode. We sure appreciate that. And Hope said, what a great episode. She says, I I attended a private school myself in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, and said, well, I never experienced sexual abuse. I certainly experienced physical abuse. Hope says there was corporal punishment if one acted in a fashion that was not deemed acceptable. I've been hit with hockey sticks. They called them pannings. I was made to stand at the front of the class with my arms up in the air holding textbooks until they felt like my arms were on fire. I was made to stand with my fingers pressed against the chalkboard in a press-up fashion until once again my arms became weak or ached or were on fire. If one was not able to complete these physical punishments, they would receive more, of course. She says, now my experience with private school is positive in some ways. I do have a couple of lifelong friends from there, but in many other ways... It was destructive. Hope, we wanted to thank you for sharing that. Uh, And we wanted to let you know as well that when you do leave a comment on our YouTube episodes, we do our best to reply to as many as we can. Now, a lot of others of you send us emails every week, and they don't get read right away because they get placed in a very special pile for consideration to be included in a weekly tradition that's presented by our friends at Local Environmental Services. You want to make sure that you're able to blow off steam when you need to. And that's why they present a little something we call Trash Talk! All right, this one from Charlie, who sent us a note just after the federal budget dropped the other day. He says, quick summary of the budget, Jesperson, in four points. Number one, Christian Freeland has been smoking a lot of hopium. Number two, the only targets she keeps hitting are new spending goals. She missed every other forecast she's ever made. Number three, the pre-pandemic baseline budget of 2019-2020 has been obliterated by excessive deficit spending even as we recover from well beyond the pandemic. And number four, the finance minister's projections for the federal debt, public debt charges, and deficit spending are based on hope and dreams and pure fantasy. That from Charlie. Thanks for having your say, Charlie. I love this one from Kira, who said, Jespo, you always say when listeners think there's a topic we should be talking about, to send you an email. This is me emailing you about the concern everybody should have for Alberta students. Now, I'm not a classroom teacher. I'm a tutor. I'm a private teacher. I specialize in teaching student-athletes with ADHD. I work with students in grades 7 to 12, affluent students, the ones whose parents have enough money to pay for extra support. They're struggling. And if they're struggling with extra support, you can only imagine the general population. She says, I'm having students hospitalized for anxiety attacks, overdoses, and other mental health concerns. My students are dropping courses, and some of them won't graduate with their homies. It's a fucking mess. I don't think parents fully get it, says Kira. It's a different world than they grew up in. There's wild competition to get into university. Social media, 24-hour coverage of war, hate propaganda, conspiracy theories. There's COVID learning loss, but their education funding is getting cut and tuition prices are going up. That means less help for my neurodiverse students, leaving some of the most brilliant minds behind. It's a fucking mess. Now, adults chirp kids for always, like, looking down at their phones. Well, what the hell do they have to look up to? 
so much judgment, yet we have a war room. Even the name is depressing. And teachers are fucked too. People need to start paying attention. That from Kira. By the way, we're going to get Kira on the show. That's just the appetizer. How about this one from Brian who says, Jesper, earlier this week I had minor abdominal surgery. Brian, we wish you well. He says, thanks to the fantastic doctors and staff at the Rocky View in Calgary. I'm recovering nicely. But with surgery comes pain. With pain comes painkillers. And with painkillers, some of them comes constipation. He says, now the side effect warnings of that complication are understated. Despite my best efforts, this week has already been extremely challenging. This is our first constipation submission on Trash Talk, by the way, Johnny. (laughs) Not the first one slinging shit around, but for sure the first constipation one. He says, now this morning I was doing my best to work the problem out. Thanks, Brian. When my super fan wife had real talk on in the other room, and that was the game changer. The sound of your voice moved me, so to speak. And I feel like a new man because of you. What Thanks, the Ryan. World? You're the shit. That from Jesus Brian. Christ. I was going to lead the show with that one today, but then that video came out and I had to change course. Wow. And this one finally from Kelly, who is spitting fire. He says, Jespo, this might not be the biggest story. Johnny, buckle up because you were talking about this yesterday. There's no Not the over biggest here. thing going on in our world right now. He said, but I was outraged this past weekend. He says, you know, you've shared a bit about your faith, Ryan, in the past. You and Johnny have shared a little bit about pride regarding Ivan Provorov, that Philadelphia Flyers defenseman where he rejected wearing the pride jersey during an NHL warm-up. Uh, he said, uh, I was actually cross-country skiing the day I listened to that episode of Real Talk, and I said a new personal best because I was rage skiing across the Alberta prairies. He says, I keep setting personal best while listening to Real Talk, but that's a whole other email. He says, that Ivan Provorov event was bad enough, but what the hell is up with James Reimer and the San Jose Sharks? You know, the guy says in his prepared statement before their warm-ups to celebrate the team-promoted pride celebration that he loves everyone, he supports everyone, then in a next-level asshole move, he shows through his actions not to skate or wear the jersey that clearly his words are a fucking farce. In one single move, he disrespects all of those supportive of the cause. Everyone the cause is trying to raise awareness about the need for equality. He disrespects his team, his teammates, his city, the NHL, his religion, his church, and Jesus Christ. He disrespects Jesus Christ. His hypocrisy seems to slither through unchecked, and I'm just so tired of these actions going directly against athletes' words in a cowardly display. Now, sure, he has a right to choose. I'm not disputing that, but soft-mouthing this to people and standing for what he believes in, now this normalized, weak-ass response is 100% hypocritical bullshit, and it's pushed me to the edge. Kelly says, this league does nothing. The team does nothing. He lies in his statement, and he disrespects everybody, including himself, and almost nobody has a thing to say about it. Kelly says, I feel for all the people that see this action, and they see that it gets a pass, and I can't imagine how painful that is. So here I am, says Kelly, calling Reimer out. It's a piece of shit move, and either the NHL has pride-themed days and hold players accountable, in essence, amplifying it, or the NHL can announce that equality is not important to it, in the lightest, or in the slightest, and it's just a sales gimmick. I love NHL hockey, but it has to be better than this. If they can hold players accountable for not getting vaccinated, they can sure as fuck do better at protecting marginalized groups. Imagine what would happen if a player chose not to wear a Black History Month themed jersey. Your rage rambling buddy, Kelly, who wins this week's edition of Real Talk Trash Talk, presented by Local Environmental Services. As you can see, I thought uh, there'd be more of an uh, uh, uproarious response from the, yeah, there we go, the Real Talk studio audience. They love that stuff. You can send us your trash talk to talk at ryanjesperson.com, and you can check out localenvironmental.ca to find out how you could save money on garbage, recycling, fence rentals, water hauling, and more across Alberta and Saskatchewan. We're off Friday. We're off Monday. We're back live Tuesday, and we can't wait to talk to you again. Tell your friends about Real Talk. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for rating and reviewing our podcast, and have a great rest of your day. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford. 
Technical Producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepherd. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.